Um, first, I just want to thank you all for being here this evening and welcome everyone to the Roxbury Film Festival of 2020. Um, thank you all for joining our Q&A after watching the series of short films. Um, Activating Change in Society is the overall title for this series of short films. Um, first, um, we would definitely, of course, like to thank our amazing filmmakers um, for putting out this wonderful, these wonderful, wonderful films um, and joining us here this evening to answer some questions, um, but to also just give us some feedback, you know, on the process um, of, of their thoughts and of filming and what, what, what it was like for them, um, especially during these times of unrest. And we're just all in a weird state right now. So, you know, with like the many pandemics that are occurring, I think that a lot of these films couldn't have come at a better time um, just to get us all thinking about where we stand, but also a lot of this resonated so much for, for all of us. Um, so we're just gonna first start by having the filmmakers introduce themselves and then we're gonna go ahead and jump into some questions. I have some questions here, but as always, we will be taking questions from the audience um, and everyone watching. So as they begin to come in, I will um, stop my questions and ask you all's questions to the filmmakers. But um, how about we just jump in and have you all introduce yourselves, maybe just your name, where you're from, the title of your film um, and, and then, yeah. So who would like to start? Um, ladies start. first. Okay. Hi everyone. My name is Sheila Burke. I'm the producer of Boston's Homeless Crisis. Mm. Um, I'm from Boston, Massachusetts. Um, the reason why I got started in this, I used to work with the homeless years ago and it became my passion. <laughs> Each year is getting worse and worse. And I said, you know, people have to really see it to believe it. So that's when I propose to do the documentary on that. So I hope you guys see it, enjoyed it, and got a better perspective on what homelessness is all about. Because homeless is not just one category, it varies. There's so many different reasons why people are homeless. So that's why I did that. Right. Thank you. Um, my uh -huh. name is Yolanda, uh, Yolanda Johnson Young. I'm from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and my film is Finding Elijah. It's um, about the loss of my son through suicide and try to open up, to try to open up the dialogue to destigmatize getting help for mental health. Um, issues and um, to just try to create some awareness around uh, suicide prevention. Uh, my name's Eric Stange. I'm the director of Activized. I'm from Boston and uh, very glad to be here. Activized profiles about six people who were first time activists. People who had never thrown themselves into a political cause before, but something in the last couple of years. Let them to do it. I can't wait to and, watch it. I'm um, Daniel Laurent, uh, DL. I am um, co-producer of um, Just a Kid with Big Dreams, which is a short. And also my video, Outside, which was directed by Jeff Palmer. Um, you know, that's featured as well. So I think one played and then the other one played right back to back. Um, and in short, it's just a kid with big dream just kind of displays, you know, my, my story growing up, um, thoughts and dreams that I had, and then everything was changed by a, a devastating loss, um, which then completely changed the trajectory of everything. Um, and then outside features my son, Daniel, and, you know, talks about gun violence. Well, it addresses gun violence, trauma, um, you know, silence and the shame, you know, breaking a cycle. And so that's, you know, the, the topic of that, real heavy stuff. So this is gonna be a heavy discussion because nothing on here is fluffy and, and, but it's inspiring and thank you all for, for doing it. Thank you so much. Right, definitely. You're, you're definitely right with the term heavy and we're gonna have a very heavy conversation. Um, but for those of you who might not have joined a Q&A previously, um, feel free to write your questions in the Q&A um, box or in the chat. Um, and as they come up, I will definitely um, 
have those questions asked. Um, so jumping right in, um, there are many questions that I have, but I think one of the questions that first kind of come to mind are about the challenges because with these topics being so heavy and so personal, you know, for a lot of people, there must have been some challenges with either your, yourself, within yourself while making this, um, or just, you know, with the people that were featured in your films. So I'm going to um, start with you, Sheila, because as a Bostonian born and raised, I think your film did something so interesting for me. I, I wrote down what you said, where people have to see it to believe it. And I think that's very true. And your film really showcases things that I see on the daily, but I don't comprehend. Um, or that I might not necessarily truly understand because I'm just I'm just seeing it as I'm going by. But your film really gave it a lot more emphasis. So Sheila, can you can you start by just telling us maybe what some of the challenges were with you in this film? So some of the challenges were actually getting the people to do it. You know, some were just ready to go, yeah, I'll do it. And others was like, don't show my face, put me behind the screen, you know, but I'll tell my story. And I wanted to get basically not just the people that are homeless, but like you see um, city councilor at large, and this uh, she was, she interviewed. Um, I wanted to get other politicians to be interviewed so you can get their direct opinion. But she was the only one that was available and I appreciated her so much and come to find out that she worked with homelessness in the Boston school system. So I said that was a blessing that she was able to communicate and to tell the number of students that's homeless in the system. Right, definitely. Um, would anyone else like to share maybe what some of the challenges were with your film filming? Uh, I can go. I mean, I, I think challenges, um, you know, budget's always an issue, right, for everybody. <laughs> um, you know, we, we don't necessarily, um, we start with these ideas, and then once we start fleshing them out, we start realizing, oh, it's a little more difficult than I thought. Um, and whatever you're trying to present, you want to make sure that it's presented in the best light, um, because you don't get a second chance to make a first impression, you know, and so you can't just, you know, shoot something with dark lighting just because the, the subject that you're trying to share is something that's impactful. If the viewer is not going to be interested in watching it or the sound sounds like you're recording in a bathroom, you know, it's a little wild. So, um, you know, I think Jeff and I just put our heads together and literally sat at a table and, and, and taped things and used um, staple guns and Elmer's glue <laughs> and figured it out. Um, and really just did a guerrilla style and, and followed my words from the song. I'm talking about the outside video in this particular um, piece, but, you know, he followed exactly what I said. It impacted him, then inspired him to actually show a visual for it. Um, and so all the imagery in the video is very intentional. There's no just fluff, you know, um, stock footage. It's all very intentional from you know, um, message to the black man, my son's reading a book, you know, to the imagery in the background, to there's a really disturbing image of, of my son that had a gun to the back of my head. And then it reverses and I have a gun to the back of his head, which obviously as a father was really, really difficult. Um, but I wanted to do that and commit to that to really prove a point. Um, so, you know, um, I, I think that as, as artists and as filmmakers, whatever our vision is, it's important um, that we figure out how to make it happen. Whether we got to beg, borrow, steal, well, not steal, well, um, <laughs> you know, but figure it out, you know, because these messages are important. They need to be told. We can't wait for Hollywood to do it. We have to tell it ourselves. And this platform is the best platform to share it on. Right, I love that. And even outside of, you know, what you had and what you were working with, the message was so deep, even within the words, you know, the words even spoke for themselves outside of the imagery and everything else that you brought into the film. Um, and with that being said, Daniel, where did the inspiration come from 
for for your film? Um, so it's kind of tricky because I'm I'm addressing. So, I'll, so should I answer for just a kid with big dreams? You think? Sure. I'll, yeah. I answer for that. So just a kid with big dreams. Um, it wasn't a planned thing. It really was just. Um, I think we were sitting down. We had just taken some footage and and did some reshoots. And I was just talking and I was like, you know, because I knew I wanted to do a screening. So I wanted to have it in the actual, I was trying to rent out a theater. Again, you have these ideas. And then when you get the, you know, the quotes and you're like, um, and it just didn't make sense at all. Right. Because I wasn't charging people. I wanted people to come, but I'm like paying $3,000. Like, so anyway, I found a church in Quincy. um, And it's like a, you know, it's not a traditional church in that in this in the space um i knew i wanted to have like a movie like premiere right and so i didn't want people to come and trek from wherever they're coming from just to watch a video for four minutes so i wanted to have a lead up to that but i didn't i wasn't sure what that was going to look like and so what i decided was you know um my fiance at the time when i was 18 just super young to be engaged anyway however um you know, I proposed to her, we were together in middle school. She went down to Atlanta. Um, she was murdered while she was in, she was going to college. She was murdered um, that morning. Um, two of her other friends were shot. One of them was killed. Um, she died before she got to the hospital. And that just changed everything, you know, and it never made me like feel whole again. You know what I'm saying? And so and she was wanted to aspire to be an actress. I was always into music. So the plan was we were going to both go to New York. But my mother, you know, my parents were involved in street activities. Um, my mother was, was arrested, sentenced to maybe three years. And this is right at the pivotal point of my life. Um, and my father, you know, was, was um, he was using drugs, but he was detoxing. And so I was the main person stepping up for my two younger brothers. So all that is shared. Um, and I also wanted to honor and highlight people who we've lost in the city that don't get mentioned anymore. So I think it's important for people who we lost to be inspired by them and, and for their memory to live on. So, you know, there's various people from Trina Prasad, who was a, a, a young girl who was killed. I believe she was maybe eight or 10. Um, everyone up to, you know, Nipsey Hussle that impacted me tremendously as an adult you know, and it broke my heart, which got me into community activism. Um, so, you know, that was kind of the inspiration of that. It wasn't really a plan when I first went about this, but I just knew that I wanted something to lead up to the visual to make people understand the totality of it. Right, thank you. Um, so before we move on, I just want to welcome Jeffrey Palmer, um, who ah. is... Um, Jeffrey, we just did um, a round of introductions. If you don't mind just introducing yourself, your name, where you are from or currently reside um, in your film. Oh, you're I'm on mute. Kidding. Oh, you're on mute. Come on, Jeff, let's go. I think I can't unmute. Oh no, I can't, I don't have the ability to do that, but he let's see. Get it out, hold on, he's on. <laughs> there we go. There, there we go. go. All right, sorry. I I know since I, I had the invite for 7.30 and then it looked like it changed to eight, so sorry. Um, I held it down, Jeff. Yeah, <laughs> uh, my name's Jeff Palmer and I'm a filmmaker. I'm originally from New Hampshire. Uh, my wife and I spent about 10 years out in California. We came back to New England. Uh, I currently live in Cranston, Rhode Island. And um, since the pandemic hit, I've been doing a lot of artwork, which is what I used to do in California because filmmaking is a little tricky nowadays. So um, yeah, and Daniel and I met on newenglandfilm.com um, through an ad that, that he put out there and I replied to. Took a while to connect, but we finally did and we hit it off and it was a good, good collaboration. Um, and we got like sort of a two for one out of it. So two projects. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining us this evening. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. Um, so we'll um, kind of just jump back into the question about challenges. We're just kind of talking about what some of the challenges were associated with your film. Um, so I'm going to hand it off to either Yolanda or Eric, whichever one of you would like to, to take a shot at that question. 
Um, okay. I'll, I'll go ahead if you want. So um, the challenge for Activized was um, trying to find, we, we set out to make a film about Trump and the response to Trump. What were people doing to fight back against Trump? But the, it wasn't my idea. It was actually a retired high school history teacher, the mother of a friend of mine, who had the idea of, of making a film about Trump, but she never wanted to mention Trump. She didn't want to see Trump. She didn't want to hear Trump. So that was the challenge. How do we make a film about Trump where you never even mention his name? And so we finally came up with this idea of finding people who had never been moved to activism before, but the Trump era changed all that. You know, the Trump era made them realize they couldn't sit on the sidelines, they had to get involved. And the idea was to make a message that anyone could do this. You didn't have to be born to be an activist and you didn't have to be trained to be an activist. You just had to have passion about something and, and a real sense of, of making things right. And so then the challenge, I mean, it was a challenge to figure out how to do that. And then we had to figure out which issues. And then of course we had to find the people who would really bring that whole idea to life. And, and um, you know, it's the usual thing with any film, it's a combination of luck and tenacity and a lot of phone calling, a lot of emailing. But uh, a lot of times it's just luck. Right, and I think that's what you see in your film specifically is that passion. People are on fire to make change um, and are out there, you know, advocating. So uh, I love that. Um, and Iwanda? Um, I guess one of the biggest challenges was um, Elijah passed away in June of 2017 and I started classes in August. September, the end of the end of August, the first week of September, you know, so working through that process, the healing process, the grieving process, that was very challenging. And in terms of the actual filmmaking to get access to his devices, you know, um, I think I mentioned in the film that I had picked up a phone and that was May of 2018. So it was like almost a year later and I just picked it up and turned it on and it connected to the Wi-Fi. And I was like, that's weird, you know, because you have to set that up. So then I'm thinking, I'm like, this isn't in the film, but he's obviously came back to Philadelphia, you know, okay. you know, so yeah, just um, getting access to his devices and just working through the grieving process were some of the wow. challenges for me. Thank you. I have here um, in the chat a comment. Someone said, thank you, Daniel, for your film. I have lost friends and family to gun violence. Your films were impactful. Um, and, I, and I think with that, you know, everyone's going to take something very meaningful away from each of your films. And there's another question here that says films are often times about something you're passionate about. We see this, but what do you want us to take from it? So this is a question from the audience for all of you all. Um, what do you want people to take away from your from your film? Um, and Jeffrey, if you um, want to jump in, definitely feel free. We haven't heard from you, um, but that that is the question. Uh, Daniel, do you want to go first or? Well, I have a big mouth. I mean, I, you know, do you want me to go and then just throw you well, out? You? Yeah, well, uh, yeah. since I'll be probably take the uh, least amount of time. Um, so from, from my, through my eyes of working with Daniel, you know, it all, st it really started with the music, you know, so the lyrics. Um, so my job was to kind of take what the story because I look at lyrics as a story as well. The, the, the Just a Kid with Big Dreams came after. I think Daniel um, explained that. So my job was to kind of interpret Daniel's song visually and to bring some kind of narrative and context visually. And uh, so really, I just always deferred to what, you know, what sort of message... Um, the, the, the lyrics had and what Daniel wanted to kind of communicate. And we worked together on that. So, um, 
I mean, I, I do feel some of the strongest music videos out there are very interpretive. And um, that's sort of why we wanted to make this a very atypical hip hop video, because the, there was such a strong, uh, important message um, within the lyrics um, that I, I think deserved something with a little more gravity and a little more oomph um, and a little more uh, drama to it, actually. Uh, so for me, if an audience, if an audience can kind of leave, end watching the, the music video and feel that sense of um, anxiety, to feel that sense of uh, maybe their you know, hearts racing a little bit, maybe uh, they know someone who was affected by gun violence, um, I think it needs to it really, I guess my, my hope was that it, it, it strikes a chord, but it also um, kind of uh, uh, tweaks a nerve, you know, and I, and I think art is, it's important when art makes people feel uncomfortable as well. And I think even making the video for me, it was important for me to be uncomfortable in that dynamic. And I think through the process, uh, I learned a lot through Daniel and uh, that experience because it's not my experience, but I think the humanity of um, losing someone in your life and in this context through gun violence um, really had to be first and that had to be very much on our minds when we were making it. So hopefully that comes through in the piece. Uh, so, uh, uh oh, uh, Oh. I think I got a little, I, I, maybe you can still see me, but I just got a little, my screen. We can see you, we can see you. Okay, all right. Uh, so, so Jeff, that, I'll let Daniel kind so, <laughs> so, so Jeff said everything um, perfectly, you know, and, and the only thing that I'll add is it definitely was a collaborative piece and there was things that we both pushed each other in an uncomfortable way sometimes, but it was always for the benefit and, and it, we kept the art first. So it wasn't a personal thing. Um, you know, real quick, one example was um, like Eric, like what you said, you know, there's definitely in the lyrics, I think I said Trump's name once, but there was definitely certain things that I said that I just didn't want to have visually. I didn't want to say Trump's name and then you see like a red hat. And so I know during one of the lyrics, um, you know, Jeff had the idea of having you know, guys with like MAGA hats, you know, kind of looking menacing and walking towards my son, I think. I think it was something like that. And that was just a quick idea. I don't think he was like dead set on it, but it was just an idea. And I was like, no, I don't want to have anything in it. But the compromise was there was a gun in the background and it was just was pulling the trigger. And then I think Jeff, when he was doing his editing magic, he slipped in MAGA, which was like, that was brilliant because it's not apparent. You have to notice it. And then you watch it over again, and you're like, oh, wow, is that what that said? Um, another thing that we kind of went back and forth about was having my son laying on the ground outlined in chalk. You know, mm -hmm. that's a very, I mean, that's my direct lineage. That's my blood. So, you know, that wasn't, that wasn't an easy, like, hey, yeah, let's do it. Let's, let's lay him on the ground like he's dead. Um, and so we went back and forth. And then what Jeff did with the transition of it, I think was brilliant. And that was all his idea of, of making that so it wasn't just a grim, morbid. And then the ending of the video was all Jeff's idea because we couldn't figure out how to <laughs> end it because yeah. it, it's a very dark song. I wanted to have people rewatch it and get something from it, mm -hmm. but I also didn't want it to end so morbid where you'll never watch it again. So yeah. the last thing I'll say, in my opinion, I don't know if I ever told Jeff this when we were doing it, maybe I did, but for me, I wanted to make my version on a very small scale budget. <laughs> um, this is America by Childish Gambino. Mm. So I watched that video over 50 times and I got something from it each time different. And it's all interpretive, you know, so I don't ever need Childish to explain what the video is. It's up for me to understand what I think it means. And that's what I think we did with this video because the interpretations that we started hearing we looked at each other and we were like, yeah, yeah, that's what we meant to do. Yeah. Yeah. That's not what well, we the, Sometimes the, what happens is the audience can fill in that blank, right? The audience is that third 
party that 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 takes in that information and makes it their own and makes your own decisions or make you know makes um, you know fills in the blank. And I, I do want to say in do the right thing. Radio Rahim had the love hate, mm. you know, and I think the hate was what we changed to MAGA in the on the gun. Mm. Um, so hate MAGA, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, people people definitely have the the what is it when you leave things to be up to interpretation? That's really powerful because they can kind of take from it what they get from it, you know, and the messages sure. always resonate differently with everyone. Um, but keeping, keeping that question in mind, um, Eric, what about you? What do you want people to take from your film, Activized? Um, I think the main message is, is pretty much what I said before, that, that we, we can all become activists. You, we, we all have it within ourselves. And sometimes you gotta look around for what your particular passion or cause will be. But, you know, one of the things that's really interesting about all the people in, in my film, and I think a lot of people in, in a lot of these films, is that it's not just one thing, that all these things are related. I mean, gun violence is certainly related to all sorts of other issues, homelessness and housing policies, and, you know, it, just, it all overlaps. And I think, uh, you know, when somebody Somebody might be identified as an activist in one particular thing, but chances are that person is working in lots of ways in lots of areas. Um, but yeah, in terms of the overall message, I think it's that it's important to just do something. You know, you're not going to change the world. You're not going to, you know, it's, it's, you've got to be satisfied with very small steps. Mm -hmm. But if you don't take any steps, then nothing will ever happen. Mm. So that, that's what I hope people can take from it or part of it anyway. Okay, thank you. And Sheila, what about what about you? I had to unmute myself. <laughs> no um, so I totally agree with Eric. You know, it all overlaps all our films, what we did because of activism. But I want people to take away that, you know, you're so fortunate if you're able to be housed. You're living in a house. All these people that you see, you're going to work, you're walking. I'm very emotional about it when you're walking, especially in the wintertime. You know, you see them sitting on the pavement or at a bus stop and you're dressed all warm and stuff. They are barely dressed, you know, people just bypassing them like they don't exist and they do. So I just want people to take away that these people are human. Right. And they need housing services and everything else. Sorry for being so emotional, but that's, that's my take on the homeless. No, it's okay. Yeah, Thank your you film know. hit a lot. Oh, sorry, yeah. Yolanda, go ahead. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Sheila. I haven't seen your film yet. I still have to watch a few more in, in our block. But, um, you know, I'm tearing up right here because like there's a lot that's not in my documentary about my son. Like when he left, like Elijah wasn't a sneakers kid. You know, he wore cargo pants and three quarter like ankle boots. You know, he wore ankle leather ankle boots with the zipper on them. He didn't wear sneakers or blue jeans or anything like that. And um, he he'd left home on May 16th, 2000 or May 19th, 2016. He was missing for about eight months before we found out he was living in New York City. He was 20 by this time and um, he didn't want to come home. But <clears throat> when when he left, he left with those boots. And um, I was going through one of his phones and um, I saw pictures of his feet. Right. And um, it looked like he had no shoes and he was just walking. You know, he was at a doctor's office and his feet were bandaged up. And, you know, that broke me. That broke me. That broke me. Because I, I just like, what did he endure? 
you know, for the time that he was on his own. And whatever was going on in his head didn't allow him to reach out for help. Like, it wasn't just me. It was his dad, his brothers, his cousins, his grandmother. I mean, there were people, people, friends, and he just didn't reach out to anyone, you know? So I think um, that that's the one thing that really really, really gets me, you know, just knowing that he was out in the street and I have a little more compassion. You know, I keep um, like fruit snacks and like um, granola bars and little bottles of water in my car so that if I come across a person who needs, I just hand it to them, you know, I just hand it to them, you know, and, and the young men who are hustling at the gas stations around in Philly, you know, I try to strike up a little conversation with him. I ask him, you know, now, now I have a 12 year old at home and I'm not working. So I don't really have it to give like that, but I'll tell you what, I do talk to him. And if I find out that they are homeless, there's a place um, in Philadelphia that Elijah went to Broad Street Ministries and they let you use their them for an address to collect your mail. You know, certain days you can come take showers. There are laundry days. They have days where you can come and do like shopping in the little donation area, but it's free. You know, they feed you bre- uh, breakfast and, you know, it's lunch and dinner every day. They, they feed the homeless every day. You know, so I always try to give resources like, yo, if you can get down there, you know, at least you can try to make a step towards getting yourself together, you know, but yeah, that I'm, I'm sure your movie is going to have me really, really, really messed up, you know, but because um, I really. And that's that's one of the reasons why I want to get into the, the other devices that that I have of his, because he was always writing and and just as a mom, even though it's going to be painful me, for me to find out the truth and what he actually experienced, I just I just need to know. You know, I just, I want to know, you know, what it was that he actually went through because my, my imagination just goes, you know, and I would rather know something as opposed to just wondering and making my own assumptions about what it was, but. Right. Yeah. What kind of make coming to your own conclusion. Yeah. You know, but, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, because, you know yeah. each and every one of us can make a difference by you giving them those resources a cup of water a donut food you know that's all that matters because everyone needs help now and then you yeah. know because someone helped my child when he, he he survived a year on his own and someone helped him and I can't just turn my back you know when I see other young men or anybody any of them you know, it doesn't matter, black, white, Asian, it doesn't matter. No. You know, oh, if they're in that, if they're in that position and if I have something in my car, I will give it. My 12 year old has seen me give what I was about to eat. I was just bought it. I was about to get down. And he, I was like, oh no, uh-uh, you're hungry. Here you go. And Benjamin was like, well, don't worry about it. I'll get more. I'll get another one for me, but they need it. They need it. I just want it. Yeah. You know? Yolanda, I think too, with everything that you're saying, like your film, just like so many of the other films really touched on topics that are so relevant today, you know, mental health and mental health and wellness, homelessness, gun violence. Um, And so it it just shows that there are so many more stories to tell and to continue writing. Um, And so with that, I'm curious to know, you know, what else are you all working on to keep this to keep these conversations going and to keep bringing awareness because that's what your films are doing. Um, and you can definitely start Yolanda if you'd like and we can just kind of go around because I'd love to know. Okay, well, you know, I, I look back on my life as just my life, you know, but when I look back on my life and I s- mention things to people and they go, what? You know, um, there was a time that I was, when I was nine years old, my mother married a man who was in federal witness protection. And we went from um, on a two year cross country journey, you know, and um, when I asked my friends from high school, they're like, you never told me, you never told me, you never told me. And I'm like, you know, it almost made me question like, wait, did it really happen? Yeah, you know I mean, because I was little, but then I, I found my photographs and I started looking at those photographs and I was like, yo, that, I remember that, I remember that day and I rode all the way to the coastline and, you know, but it's like the secret, and I'm an only child, 
you know, so the secrecy and the isolation from being in that situation actually carried through to my adult life. I, I stayed in an abusive marriage for years. I didn't tell anybody. I didn't, didn't say anything, you know? And it's like, if just like I, I said, if it can happen to me, it, it's happening to other people. I know I wasn't the only person in federal witness protection as a child, you know? So it's like, I wonder how, how their lives are, but you just don't put an ad on Craigslist for that, <laughs> you know? So I said, well, um, I'll just do my story you know, and hopefully I can generate a community of individuals who have the shared experience and, you know, really talk about it because that secrecy and isolation is, ugh, yeah, so that's what could I'm you, working on. <laughs> I'm hearing there be follow-up. <laughs> could you remind me, could you just tell me, because I missed the beginning, could you tell me the names of your, the titles of your films? Sure, it's Finding Elijah. Finding Elijah, okay. Well, Jeff, so you know, it's it's next to the name. Well, Sheila didn't put hers in, but hers is um, homelessness, I believe. Oh, okay. But yeah, well, I sent you a message. Right. I'm trying to be Activized sweet. Finding Light and Sheila's is... Well, what was it? Homelessness. Great. Okay, thanks. Just wanted to have that written down. I was trying to be sneaky, Jeff. <laughs> and sneak right it over to you. <laughs> <laughs> um... So uh, with that, uh, who would like to answer next? What are you working on? What else can we expect from you all in the future to keep this all going? Oh, Eric, you unmute it. You're going to go? Yeah, okay. I know. <laughs> That's the giveaway. Um, I started a film in February that, like so many things, got shut down, but it was, I thought, going to be really interesting. Um, the daughter of some old friends of mine works for Democratic campaigns, and she has seen a lot of things go wrong in Democratic national campaigns. Uh, she worked for Obama, though, and that went right. So that's where she learned what things could be. But she started this initiative and convinced the Democratic National Committee to do it, which was to hire a thousand young people who were just coming out of college this past spring and train them. They started last summer, and the idea was to pay them and train them to be really good political organizers, really you know, smart, accomplished people who knew what they were doing when they hit the ground running. And they weren't gonna be committed to any one candidate. They were gonna be committed to whoever the Democratic candidate was. And they were gonna work in just in the battleground states and in their own neighborhoods and in their own communities. You know, it sounds so obvious, but the Democrats had never done it. The Republicans haven't done it. It's called Organizing Core 2020. So I was going to follow the recruitment of some of these people. The, the, I call them kids, but you know they're early 20s mostly. Um, their their recruitment, their training, and then follow them this summer and this past summer and the fall, right up to the election. And of course, it all moved online. And you know, they're still. Uh, my friend succeeded in hiring 850 or so people and training them. So. Let's hope they make a difference. Anyway, sorry, that's the film that didn't happen. <laughs> so, but the idea too was to be building a cadre of young political organizers who would stay involved in politics, in electoral politics or any politics. And, um, you know, <clears throat> of course it started um, before the murder of George Floyd and before the, the summer, you know, the, these incredible, amazing events of the past few months. And right. so, that I think is going to have an enormous impact on politics in, in these battleground states. And so the hope is that these, this cadre of, of people who are now trained to be political organizers will stay and work in that field, in that area. Awesome. So I'm still going to try to find some of them when things open up. I want to follow some of them, see where they go with their lives, whether they stay involved in, in different kinds of political organizing. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. And, and Daniel, I, I feel like you had something you were going to. Well, to, I was going to throw to, um, it's kind of weird. I feel like tag teaming. Like, I don't want to, Jeff, do you want to go? Well, I'll just say, yeah. So last year, so 2019 was, I, I was pretty busy with, with film. Um, it was a good year. I worked with Daniel uh, and we did those two projects. I finished a documentary called the Faces of Mo Fencing Club, which is a uh, fencing club in Somerville, Massachusetts, 
which is where we used to live. Uh, so I finished that um, and I worked, I did a short art artist uh, bio, like about, I think it turned out to be like seven minutes or something like that. When we moved here, I met an artist and sort of like a little profile piece. So I was very busy with that. And, uh, and Daniel and I are still getting outside out there, uh, film festivals and all that, which feels good. Um, but then, you know, pandemic happened, my wife and I moved and I really sort of filmmaking just became very um, difficult. Um, it's difficult anyways, right? You know, financing, timing, scheduling, crews, there's so much that goes, so many moving parts. Um, and it's even that more, makes it more difficult with COVID restrictions and, uh, and the like. So I did a pivot and I had been doing art out in California. And so I kind of picked that up because I wanted to stay creative, uh, but art is something you can do on your own. <laughs> and so I didn't need, you know, um, five or 10 people to, to uh, while I love it, I, I love making movies and music videos and such. Um, yeah. And I want to, I want to do it again. It's just that I, you know, I, I couldn't keep sitting home waiting for all of it to, you know, the pandemic to end and, and projects to miraculously come back to life. I know, I'm sure everyone's like thinking like, you know, trying to just jump back in and the pandemic was definitely yeah. not, not helpful with and I any think, of that. You know, Zoom, Zoom and, and I, so I work with a company in Providence and we do video production and corporate stuff and some commercials. And uh, I managed to do one of our clients, Amgen, um, needed, uh, they were doing an like, anniversary video, but we couldn't do in-person interviews. So it turned all online. Uh, so, but I was surprised at how much of a connection we were able to make even in this, in this venue here, right? Um, with, with just online uh, 2D faces and voices, but it, 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 it it can fill the void, I think, a little bit. I think it can, it's, it is a way of staying connected. Um, so, so thank you, Lisa, for <laughs> making this all happen online, because I'm sure it was not what you had intended. <laughs> yeah, and with that, I just got the notification that we are literally almost done, which this flew by. Um, but I just wanted to say thank you to all of our wonderful filmmakers. I'm not sure if there was any like last things you wanted to add, Yolanda. Thank you for adding in um, your film for all the panelists to find. Um, we're excited to see what you all continue continue to work on, um, especially during these times. But if if there was any last minute messages that you all wanted to share or send, um, definitely feel free to very quickly. <laughs> I have some. Yolanda, okay. can I say something? I just, I just wanted to know how can I oh, stay yeah. in contact with you all? Maybe you can just put your Instagram or your email or something in the chat and I'll save the chat and I'll come mm -hmm. yeah. sure I have your, your information. I'll do it right Good. now. Filmmakers um, Unite. <laughs> um, I yeah. would say, you know, um, really, really quickly, um, I can't type. It. I thought I was talented. I can't like type. It. <laughs> All right. So, um, so really quickly from this video led to me being really active in the community. So from Jeff's vision, you know, putting it out there, Kim Janey, who's the city council president of Boston. Um, she loved the video, presented it at town hall. Um, it opened up for summer violence initiatives led to a million other things. I started getting involved, 10,000 Fearless Peacemakers, which led me to Brothers Building, my brother James Mackey. We actually um, took forth um, Commission for Black Men and Boys. It was a bill that was presented by state rep um, China Tyler that got passed and it, it okay. you know, worked to get it passed. Now we're tweaking language and, and, and logistics. Um, and we held a press conference, really radical revolutionary in front of the state house um, all black people, all black uh, activists. We didn't speak to the press. We let the press take what we were saying and it was our stories, our narrative and it couldn't get twisted. Um, mm -hmm. So I say all that to say, you know, this wasn't my, my journey, so to speak, before outside, but outside led me into this work. So I'm still doing artist stuff and still doing film and writing songs, but everything I'm doing now is real intentional. Um, the, I'm putting the medicine in the candy. I'm being very intentional with <laughs> the words that I'm saying, the images that I'm associated with. And, you know, I just wanted to thank 
this platform, Roxbury Film Fest, is a staple and I'm so proud to be a part of it. And thank mm. you publicly, Jeff, um, for believing and working with me and, you know. Yeah. Right, you um, just gave my closing speech for me basically, Daniel. So thank you for wrapping us up. We are officially out of time. Um, they put in the chat um, to remember to check out the rest of our films for this evening. Um, but again, I just want to thank you all so, so much for your time, for your beautiful, wonderful films. And we hope to, to reconvene again next year um, and in between, of course. Absolutely. So check out the um, chat. There's some information in there. But that is all the time that we have together this evening, y'all. So for those that are part of Roxbury um, Film Festival, feel free to, to stay. But um, the Q&A is officially over. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Sorry, Bye. 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 See you soon. Good Thank night. You. We will see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Yes.